being recorded. Welcome, everybody. It, it's really nice to have you with us this morning for this webinar on competency-based education. Um, one of the things that um, I want to start out with is, of course, introducing who are the facilitators today. I'm facilitating. My name is Marcia Miles, and I'm with EdTech Specialists. And Lisa Sitkins is also with EdTech Specialists, and Lisa will be helping out as well. I was um, also want to make sure that I, you know, thank our sponsors. You can see them on the screen here: um, Michigan Virtual, My Virtual Academy, and ThinkSpace. All have been sponsors for us, which is really nice that they're showing their support as we um, have these conversations um, across Michigan and beyond. We can tell that, you know, we've got people from across our borders joining us this morning, which is even nicer. Um, but you always want to thank. Um, these sponsors because they're the ones who are really helping to kind of support the efforts that you know Lisa and I are putting into putting all this together for you guys and we're enjoying that. One of the um, things I was thinking about this morning before I kind of kick it over to introduce and kick it over to Fred is that we, this is we you know come to the halfway mark in these webinars. We have ten lined up and this is the sixth one, so we're actually starting part two and. As I reflect on, you know, since the beginning of the, you know, since the first webinar at the end of May, you know, we've had a lot more conversation in Michigan about competency than we had prior to this. That's the goal, is to kind of create um, not only an understanding, but conversation around this. And I'm glad to see that's really happening. Um, as I said before, you know, my goal was to kind of get it started in Michigan, but it's been very clear because we're posting this on LinkedIn and um, different websites that other people are joining too and watching them um, in the archive version. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that they're accomplishing their goals, that we're, you know, reaching out and, and getting a better, uh, you know, a different view, a deeper view of what competency based education is about. Um, what, what we're doing is, as you know, we're recording this, so if you're listening to it, um, you, you now can see up on the screen that we have contact information for our presenter so that you can reach out to him um, if you know, you're not with us and have questions for him. He's open to that. Um, and you can also, during the webinar, and, and Fred is really open to having you converse with him, so please feel free to either put it in the chat or you can put it in the chat you want to be unmuted because um, we tend to mute people just so we don't get the feedback during the recording. But if you want to have a conversation with Fred, just put that in there. Just say, please unmute me, and we'll open it wide up so that you can participate in a back and forth with Fred. We're going to enjoy this conversation this morning, and um, my introduction is really, um, you know, I'm never going to cover all the things, Fred, that you've done and all the great things that you're doing in New Hampshire right now. But, you know, I guess I want to just kind of give a little peek at how I first became introduced to you because I initially I met Rose Colby, and Rose is um, the co-author of the book Off the Clock, Moving Education from Time to Competency. And she asked if I would read through that, um, the book, the manuscript, that you, Fred, and, and Rose were putting together. And as I um, did that, and, and I did it several times, because... You know, after you guys would make revisions, she'd ask if I'd read through it again. And I, you know, I was honored to do that. So but the part that always struck me was the very beginning of, you know, your epiphany, Fred, where you talk about, you know, kind of the, the turning point of how conversation really changed as you were looking at, you know, how to give credit to students for work that wasn't done in a, you know, a classroom, if you will. And, and as I've listened to other people talk about the transition from looking at education from, you know, seat bound and time um, connected to time to looking more at what the kids are learning and replacing time doesn't matter as whether or not they do learn, um, you know, that epiphany has taken place differently for people and in different states, different, you know, scenarios. And, but every time I read through yours, it just seems so obvious. You know, it's like, ah, oh, the light bulb goes on for everybody. We can give credit for a kid doing a dance class, you know, for PE, because, 
they're obviously meeting the same kind of expectations and standards. So I'm always looking for advice on how to kind of get that conversation started. And I dare say from reading your book, Fred, it doesn't sound like that was planned. It was just kind of a one of those things that occurred. Um, but any uh, any uh, suggestions you can ever give us on how to you know transition over, get epiphanies going on across the country. Um, you know, always appreciate that input. It is my pleasure to introduce Fred to you, all of you this morning. I encourage you to look and read, look at the book and read through Moving Education from Time to Competency. It's an excellent read. You can read it a hundred times and you'll learn something new every time. So Fred, if I can transition over to you and again everybody, join the conversation. That was That's what Fred is looking forward to. Great. Thank you so much, Marsha. So uh, nice to be with you all this morning. Um, and uh, it, it puts a smile on my face to hear you uh, to hear you use the word uh, uh, epiphany because that's what it was for all of us. There was no one that went into what we were trying to accomplish with a plan. Only that we weren't satisfied with where, where uh, education was and uh, so what should it look like and um, so back uh, I'll, I'll give you all a little bit of history um, on me because I think that it'll help you I was a terrible student um, in my high school class I finished 206 out of 212 kids so I beat six kids um, I got rejected by every college that I applied to um, my mom told me that if I didn't go to college, I was going to have a hard time making a living, and she scared me. And you know, so I went to school nights to try to get my grades up a little bit, and then uh, reapply. Uh, I, I I reapplied to. I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, uh, but I knew that I loved being around kids, so I thought maybe I'll be a teacher. So I reapplied to Keene State College, and um, got in. Um, four and a half years later. Uh, finished with a 2.3 GPA because uh, while you know while I knew I loved kids I still hated school and uh, fortunately for me I majored in science and there's always been the sh shortages of science teachers so I got a job teaching science in Stanford Connecticut um, I taught eighth grade for six years and um, uh, you know so it, you know it you know it always was for me uh, there's got to be a better way to do this. I swear that my, you know, from my from my classes, my, you know, that my kids were never going to be bored in class, and um, and it was important for me that that they loved coming to my class, and uh, because I knew what it felt like to be disengaged, and so I, you know, I left teaching after six years uh, to uh, I, I had started my own uh, business, a uh, little music store. I started with six hundred dollars. And um, and turned it into the fifteenth uh, largest of over eleven thousand music stores in the country, and uh, so it was it was an absolutely amazing ride, and uh, all during this uh, this um, time of growing this company from nothing, uh, it, you know I was getting asked to do you know to do interviews to be on uh, on uh, radio television newspapers uh, and I mean it was it was very exciting and um, you know when it, as when it first started happening I thought you know it's, boy it's interesting these people are interested in talking to me because I guess they don't know that I'm not very bright and um, and uh, s school taught me that I wasn't very bright and life taught me that school was wrong and uh, the you know after a while I started thinking that you know I'm Probably a whole lot smarter than they than they thought. How did school miss me, and and how many other kids are they missing? And so I've been on this lifelong path to find a different way to do school. And so I ran for governor of New Hampshire. I lost, uh, but some of the people that worked on my campaign went to work for uh, another campaign in a, a in a uh, in the um, following election cycle and. Um, and it was uh, uh, Craig Benson who was running as a, a businessman, and they told him that if you want to talk about education, you really should talk about talk to Fred. So we sat down, had a good conversation. Um, 
uh, he won. He asked me to chair the State Board of Education, charged me with redesigning the system, and a charge that <clears throat> I think most people would have run screaming away from, but it was exactly the charge that I was looking for. And uh, so I, he gave me uh, the parameters that uh, you start with a clean sheet of paper and challenge everything. And so that's what I did. And so there was no specific plan. He didn't say, I want this and I want that. He didn't give me all, all this list of, of things that would be in this new education system, only that he wanted a new system. And uh, so uh, I had served on the State Board of Education in the uh, 90s uh, and was very aware of the, the state regulations, the minimum standards for public school approval. Every state has a similar document. Uh, and there was this big fight in New Hampshire about the regulations. And so um, that's actually how I got uh, engaged. One of the, the fight got so contentious that one of the members of the state board quit. And there was an opening on the board. I had served as the uh, chairman of the state's assessment steering committee that put together our first, you know, our original New Hampshire statewide test. And they liked the job that I'd done on that, so they asked me if I would, I would uh, fill the position on the state board. So um, I did that. Um, then, uh, when uh, Governor Benson was elected, uh, he asked me to go back on the state board now as chairman. And so, um, I, you know, my first day back on the on the as chair of the board, I told the board that. Governor wants a new system. I don't know what it looks like, but I'm a 60s kind of guy who's taught to question authority. So I'm just going to ask a whole lot of questions, and we'll see where it goes. And so uh, we held our first meeting, members of the State Board of Education, members of the commissioner's cabinet. The commissioner then was Nick Donahue, who is now the head of the Nellie May Education Foundation. Uh, and um, so in the the, the uh, meeting was being chaired by one of the other members of the state board and I remember her starting it off she said let's get through the easy stuff um, because uh, you know you know when nobody's you know we're not going to do anything to change the calendar and I remember the governor saying challenge everything so uh, I, I said wait a minute uh, I said why does it have to be 180 days who cares um, and, and does anybody in in this room care that school is 180 days. Nobody cared. And um, I've yet to found, find anybody who really cares that school's 180 days. You think about the foundation of our education system in America. Uh, and that really, I haven't found anybody who defends 180 days. And uh, so we took the 180 days out of the regulations. And uh, But the amazing stuff started to happen around high school graduation requirements. and. Uh, I uh, I said to the group, you know, I've had this question that's always bothered me. Um, we give credit to our graduation for, um, com you know, successfully completing gym class, but if you're on the gymnastic team, you don't get any credit. I said, and I said, you know, why is that? And there was silence around the table, and I I said, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not telling you I'm an expert. I was a PE minor. It just seems to me that the sports teams are higher level of skill, teamwork, sportsmanship, and the kids who uh, uh, participate in, in sports teams more often than not continue with their physical activity beyond high school. So how come gym class counts, those uh, you know sports teams don't count? And uh, so then somebody said, well, maybe we should count the sports teams. And I said, that's okay with me. Is that okay with everybody else? And... Uh, everybody just kind of nodding in, looking around the room for approval, and I said, uh, "Well, that's okay with me, but you know, uh, but um, what if the school doesn't have a gymnastics team? But there's a gymnastics academy downtown, and the exact same lessons and skills that would have been learned if the school had a gymnastics team are are, are going to be learned at this uh, in, at this gymnastics academy." And you just told me you give credit for that, so let me see if I understand this. If you learn the desired lessons and skills inside the school, that counts for credit toward graduation. If you learn the exact same thing outside the school, that doesn't count. What do we care more about? Do we care more 
that our uh, that our schools are the first hand deliverer of the learning experience or do we care more that our kids learn the desired lessons and skills regardless of the source of the learning everybody in the room said that they cared more about our kids learning that was the epiphany moment for us it was like holy mackerel we have just made a statement that we care less about whether schools do the teaching um, than we care about whether the, or not the kids learn. So uh, we started talking about different ways that kids could learn. Kid goes to France and spends two months in France and learns to speak French. Can he get a French credit? Kid, uh, um, you know, does a, a, a you know a, a, a gets a journalism in, internship at the uh, local newspaper, you know, can that uh, count as a language arts uh, credit for mastering whatever the competencies would be? On and on, giving all these examples of possibilities, and that, in essence, is what we have put inside the New Hampshire regulations. And so we we call these ELOs, extended learning opportunities. Uh, some of us have tried to get the name changed to experiential learning opportunities, but you know, whatever, everybody knows in essence what we're talking about. So, but we blessed any way that a, a, a student can demonstrate mastery of the required competencies, they can now get credit in New Hampshire. Um, and uh, some school districts have done an absolutely amazing job uh, taking this to the community, you know, getting community partners to participate with the school. Uh, other school districts still are operating pretty much the way they have uh, in the past. Um, but I would say that all school districts have been impacted some and the conversation is ongoing, including the ones that are, are, uh, are still stuck uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, in a, a time-based system, um, so, and we are, um, and, and we're not, we're not, you know, uh, you know, we're not where we need, in, where we need to be. We are getting there. Uh, we are are uh, not where we need to be. Uh, I saw um, Mike just asked a question about credentialing, and um, that that is part of the problem. I, I now have a, an office at Southern New Hampshire University. And um, and we are in conversations now about credentialing, about you know, because the educators are still going through, you know, in large part, um, uh, preparation for a, a you know a time-based system. Although I will tell you that we have done some um, some significant changes to our our educator development um, and teacher training re uh, regulations that uh, we, we um, have pretty much removed the word teacher uh, and put in educator. We have pretty much removed the word classroom and put in learning environments. And we pretty much removed the word instruction and put in learning and learning strategies. And when you look at the uh, regulations on, uh, on educator development, that it is clearly uh, aimed at moving us away from a system of teaching and to a system of learning uh, in an anytime, any place, anyhow, any pace environment. That said, um, the uh, and and while I think that um, that the I mean all the education. Uh, Institutions, the educator preparation programs in New Hampshire, uh, have to you know go th you know use those regulations to get um, you know to uh, to get uh, reauthorized. Um, that that's that's a that's a time uh, you know thing. It comes up every few years, um, and uh, you know I I don't know any that have really taken the plunge uh, and said. We are going to create um, a certificate program on what it is to be a competency-based educator. And right now, in at Southern New Hampshire University, we are engaged in those conversations. We haven't 
you know, we haven't done it yet. We are in the in initial phases of the conversation about what it, you know, what it means to be a competency-based educator. So, um, so we, you know, we put the regulations in place in um, in 2005, and when I look at where we are, we are all over the map. We've got some school districts that are doing an absolutely phenomenal job. They get visitors from around the country that go to see school districts like Pittsfield, Sanborn Regional. Um, these are school districts that have really taken this notion of of, of a, a competency-based uh, system and depressed the accelerator on it. Make no mistake, they are still operating in a time-based system, um, but it is you know it is a transition. Uh, eventually, what I expect that will happen, and I don't know how long this will take but that we will move away from a time-based system and we will move to a system where you do not advance based on how old you are. Uh, you will advance uh, based on what level of learning you're, uh, you're on. My, uh, <clears throat> my biggest issue with Common Core is that they framed it as uh, grade levels, this is you know what you're doing. And it says grade one, grade two, grade eight, grade ten, and um, um, I think they should have framed it as level one, level two, level five, level eight, whatever. And so that that these were the the expectations of students uh, at, uh, at 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 level one when students can demonstrate mastery of that, they move to level two. Um, it's really no different than karate lessons. That um, that doesn't matter if you're six years old or you're sixty years old. If you're if uh, you know you're working on a particular belt, when you can demonstrate mastery of those competencies, you move to the next level. And I think eventually that's where we're going to go in education and figuring out how we do that with you know with kids and is you know with the, you know uh, developmentally et cetera. Uh, you know, is is a conversation to, to to be had that will continue to be had, but but I think that that's a, you know that that's where we'll go. Now, uh, I I, uh, I left the state board in 2013, um, and I've been told that I served longer on the New Hampshire State Board than anybody in the history, um, and but uh, I left the board because I felt like I could do more off the board. And started a, a nonprofit called the National Center for Competency-Based Learning, and um, and the plan was to uh, is to uh, formalize the experiential learning process and to uh, embed it as a as a, uh, a a central component of what an education in a public system would be. Um, I often uh, show. Uh, on uh, uh, PowerPoint or whatever, even in, in conversations like this, <clears throat> a little uh, depiction of what, uh, to me, school is today, education is today, and I show this big circle, and that that's classrooms, and I show this little circle, and that's online learning, and then I show this tiny dot, and that's experiential learning, and um, and then I say I show them what I believe that that uh, education is going to look like and the, the, it's going to be three circles of the same side, uh, size uh, interlocked in the Venn diagram and that's just the way education is going to be. That sometimes kids are going to be in classrooms and sometimes they're going to be online and sometimes they're going to be in real world environments and these things are, are going to link because it's not going to be isolated that you know uh, just because you're doing um, you know, a, a a biology course, and it's 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 not necessarily all going to be uh, in uh, in uh, one of those uh, you know uh, silo areas, either classroom, online, or or a uh, real world. It will be a combination of the above, and uh, and I think that uh, for and, and I and I believe that school is going to be student driven. That that the future of 
public school in the United States is going to be uh, that the change is not going to come about as a result of fabulous educators uh, doing a great job convincing everybody that uh, that this is what we should do, but it's going to be uh, it's going to happen as a result of simply creating these options and making them visible to kids and accessible to kids and then letting the students vote with their feet on how they want their learning and when this happens that school as we know it will dramatically change when students find out that they do not have to sit in a classroom uh, as they have done forever in order to get their credits that they can do this in other ways uh, that they um, uh, that they can learn biology uh, you know at the Seacoast Science Center at the Audubon Society um, at you know so many other options that are available in our communities that many of them will say I would rather do that and when they vote with their feet, the system will be forced to change. And one of our school districts in New Hampshire that's done a great job, Lebanon, um, and um, the uh, the former principal in a conversation with her, she she told me that when they first informed the faculty that this is what they were doing, they were opening this thing up, um, and they were going to give kids opportunities all over the community to. Um, to uh, you know, acquire their uh, their skills and ultimately their credits. Um, and uh, the the PE teachers were told that all the sports teams are now going to count for credit. The kids, you know, that if they want to use a sports team for credit for their PE credit, that that that's now going to be available. When the students found out that they didn't have to go to gym class anymore, that they could that they could use the sports teams. Um, the it, um, that's again Lebanon Lebanon school district when the students found out um, there was this exodus of a significant number of kids going to uh, you know using the sports teams to get their their uh, gym credits the PE teachers got together and said if we don't do something we're gonna be out of a job and so the PE teachers got together and started creating courses on personalized fitness, um, outdoor education with kids kayaking and doing other outdoor sports, and a bunch of the kids started coming back. That's what really ultimately needs to happen: is that that we're o that the only offerings that we are going to have uh, are going to be exciting offerings because the ones that have been boring kids are are basically going to go away. Because the new system will be, um, the new system uh, will be exciting, um, because uh, it'll it'll be tailored to every single kid. In the in the essence, we will end up with a customized learning experience for every single student, impossible to do inside the walls of the school. But if you harness all of the resources in your community, uh, then um, then. Uh, that opportunity is there and so <clears throat> I started uh, on you know for our, our center the National Center for competency-based learning I started our first project uh, is called 10,000 mentors and um, I went to the state board and the commissioner and with the plan um, that uh, the goal is to identify, recruit, and train 10,000 doctors, lawyers, accountants, manufacturers, software developers, you name it, um, uh, all to be made available uh, for kids for credit toward graduation. Uh, the state board and the, uh, and the commissioner uh, enthusiastically signed on and endorsed it. The commissioner asked me to speak at her uh, um, Monthly meeting with the with the superintendents, uh, and the first school district in the state to come forward and say we want to be we want to do this uh, was Manchester. Manchester is our largest city, and um, and so I mean it was 
very exciting to me that you know so I've been working with Manchester for about a year on this and um, so I told you know I told Manchester we get him a thousand mentors in, in five years the the superintendent said can you do it in three years <laughs> I said so we'll try uh, so uh, you know we're putting the pieces together uh, to make this happen and um, there has been uh, excitement about it in the city broad buy-in people get it um, and uh, the you know and so uh, Southern New Hampshire University asked me to um, to set up an office there because they want to uh, they want to use Manchester uh, as um, as uh, their lab their learning lab to figure out how to formalize this process to ensure that uh, what we're doing is of high quality, um, that it is um, meeting the competencies necessary for kids to get these credits, that if the uh, if uh, a particular learning experience is a competency or too short, then what is the process of uh, of getting you know getting those other competencies uh, done? Is it is it through New Hampshire's Virtual Learning Academy? Is it uh, uh, another? Is it a, a classroom experience? Is it a tutoring experience? You know, all of this stuff. You know, we are are uh, you know looking at how do we again put this together so that we can train educators who have been taught that their job is inside of a time-based system, taught that. Uh, that uh, you know, if kids don't master the required competencies, you just give them a, a you know a, a, a B, a C, or a D, and uh, and pass them on anyway, regardless of of the fact that there are are uh, major uh, competencies that they are missing that are going to impact how you know how their learning happens for the rest of their years. Uh, in our right. book, yes. Um, some of the the individuals that are participating, can, can you give some specific details? Um, you know, a lot of the districts that we have um, been talking with, they understand the concept that they want to have these experiential learnings count for credit. Yep. But I think the biggest question that comes up from individuals is, how do you? you know, I know there has to be the legislative piece, but how do you? get the credit how do you do the credentialing for that you know and, and how is that equivalent in terms of how many competencies or standards are met so can, do you have any specific examples you can give us from some of the school districts on how they're doing that so here's what i would say uh and that's why uh, uh thank you for the question lisa uh, here's what i would say um we, we're still you know I, and uh, i mentioned this to marcia earlier while I think that New Hampshire probably gets an uh, an A, um, you know, for uh, its uh, um, efforts in competency-based learning uh, in on a norm uh, reference scale, um, that uh, if it's a standards-based scale, a criterion reference scale, that New Hampshire, you know, I, I'm going to guess. C minus, and I might be generous um, that we still have so far to go on this, um, uh, you know. But we are in, you know, because we're asking these questions too. So here's what I would say: I would say that well, first, the Department of Ed pretty much has uh, on on its website competencies for most of the, you know, the common courses. So. But school districts are allowed to have their own, uh, you know, courses. So a biology course, uh, the competencies uh, um, on the uh, Department of Ed's website um, may be the same competencies uh, that are uh, on a local school district's website. But a school district has uh, the autonomy to uh, to modify them. So you know, so they're not necessarily all the same. But let's take, uh, I'll take a, a simple example uh, that, you know, uh, uh, my wife and I were asked by uh, uh, our U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen's uh, daughter um, to work with her, um, with their daughter, uh, so uh, Senator Shaheen's granddaughter, 
she wants to be a uh, professional actress. Um, and um, in this one, and when she was in uh, middle school, she was thinking about, well, what school does she want to go to? She really wanted to go to Portsmouth High School, but didn't feel that the curriculum at Portsmouth High School was going to put her in a position to be able to apply to the elite schools, the uh, uh, Tisch School of the Arts at NYU, the uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Yale, some of the, you know, the schools that are really well known for their theater arts programs. And uh, so, it, you know, was there a way to get it so that Portsmouth High School could become a school that she would be happy to go to, but uh, put her in a position to be able to get the credits that she wants uh, that are going to show up on her report card and uh, and convince uh, some of these schools that 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 uh, she was meant to be there, and so uh, we worked with uh, with them, uh, and uh, and she ultimately had um, the you know I mean she was going to Boston uh, two or three days a week to study with uh, the uh, at the uh, uh, children's uh, Boston Children's Theater, uh, which is really well known, has been around for a long time, has some absolutely spectacular uh, instructors. Also doing stuff locally at professional theater. Uh, we went to one of the local theaters, got uh, the Department of Ed's competencies for theater, um, brought them to the theater, uh, uh, and and said um, she wants to get this theater credit here. They looked at the competencies and they said, yeah, we can do all of these. So in that particular case, all of the competencies, the, the, the theater uh, company uh, assured us that all of those competencies would be, they would be able to get her to mastery uh, there. If they had said, um, well, we can do all but these two, then we would have had to have had a conversation about, okay, how do we get the last two? And the last two might have been uh, a, a private tutoring. It might have been. Uh, uh, it might have been, uh, you know, any in any number of ways. But we would have had to have found a different way to get those. So, uh, in New Hampshire, the Virtual Learning Academy, um, they are they they are uh, they have they are really delving into this experiential uh, learning thing. They want to be the go-to uh, place for getting kids uh, to uh, uh, a, you know, a, a mastery of whatever competencies may have been missed in their experiential learning uh, uh, experience. It, that that uh, so so um, the goal is. These are, you know, here are the here are the half a dozen or dozen competencies that are expected to be mastered in a particular um, in a particular subject. Um, a a doctor's office might get you, you know, some of those things in, you know, in in you know, in biology. It might get you some things in other in other areas. Um, but it, but where the gaps are. We have to figure out where those gaps are, and they're going to be different in probably every single, you know, probably. Well, I would say with most kids, they're going to be different. So it's you know we're still figuring this out. That's why you know we are in this conversation about how do we um, how do we go about formalizing this learning so that educators know what to do. Um, that you know, the, instead of being teaching experts, they'll become learning experts, and they'll know, um, you know, what you know what to do uh, with this. So in Manchester, we're talking. I, I hope I answered at least. I'm not sure if I did. I'm, I'm not sure if I can answer it any better. But, but please ask again if if you think that still a piece missing. Um, but uh, you know, we're still because we're still figuring this out. So in Manchester, we're talking about a thousand mentors in Manchester. What we have found is getting the community engaged is not the problem. They want to do it. Um, 
in New Hampshire, we have um, we have a lot of uh, of 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 especially high tech companies that are struggling to find employees, and um, and um, and uh, the, we put these we put these companies um, at risk if 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 they cannot get the employees that they need uh, to grow their businesses, and so um, you know that they will either they will either move or they will uh, or they will uh, uh, locate some uh, you know put put a, um, uh, uh, their growth plans in a different state, and so New Hampshire is really in a position where it has no choice but to try to figure out how to stem this. So as part of what we're doing with 10,000 mentors, we've created something called ED squared, Education Driven Economic Development. And our plan is to uh, give these companies, uh, a provide them with a limitless supply of interns, of kids, interested in a particular industry uh, and um, and uh, put them in a position where you know we become the uh, the uh, the eHarmony matching kids interest to uh, to workforce needs uh, and uh, this has our, our ED squared um, effort has been formally adopted by the New Hampshire Coalition for Business and Education, and in fact, we have a conversation coming up later this week whether they change the whole name of their organization to ED squared. And um, so, and what do we have to do to our education system to provide this limitless supply of of uh, interns of uh, of kids that uh, that would be interested in uh, particular industries? So, um, you know, so it's. Uh, right now, our our organization is also in. Uh, you know, we're getting. You know, we're we're hoping by. Uh, we are creating a, a web um, uh, a web tool, um, a piece of software uh, called uh, called Mentor Connect, uh, and it is designed specifically to have all this laid out so that um, so that all of the uh, all of the mentoring opportunities uh, in the community will be visible to kids, and that um, and all the competencies uh, for the various subjects will be on the uh, you know on the website. You know we can sort it by school district, we can sort it by curriculum area, we can sort it all kinds of ways, and all the information about the state regulations will have places on there for what uh, students you know. Uh, for students to go to, students will be able to upload uh, video um, that you know. Hi, my name is Joe. Joe, I'm uh, I'm a junior at Epping High School, and I'm here at New England Dragway working on my automotive credit. This is the car we race, and this week I'm going to be doing this. And the the uh, the the hope is to create a, a a large body of these so that kids from all around the state can see what other kids are doing. Ultimately, we want to take this nationally, um, so that because I believe that it's the it's going to be the kids that are going to lead us in um, you know in a new model of education when the kids find out that they don't have to do it in a traditional manner anymore, and they can see the options that they have, um, that they they will vote with their feet, and we will have. A new system of public education. I've been talking for a while. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. We we have about ten minutes left, and I have some questions that have come let's up in talk. the chat. Can yeah, I let's ask talk. you those? Okay. Um, uh, you said that in New Hampshire that it is mandated for competency-based learning now. Is that yes. true? Yes. Okay. Yes. It, how, it, well, how are these ELOs funded then? You know, I, you know, you say that it's it's mandated, but is there dollars behind that 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 the districts have to offer them, and then they get funded through that. Uh, no, um, that is it, that 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 um, that um, we are. If, if, if let's let's take uh, it, it's a, it's a good question because uh, because 
the uh, the state really hasn't thought this part of it out. It's a it's a it's a, a conversation that I've had with some folks, but they still haven't thought this part of it out. You know, if if one or two kids want to do an internship at the Krista McAuliffe uh, Planetarium, that the the planetarium will probably do it for free. If one or two hundred kids wants to do it at the planetarium, the planetarium's not going to do it for free. And uh, so um, so we are not yet at a point where these outside opportunities are 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 creating so much. Um, uh, excitement in, in a school district, that, but they're going to need to be funded. That um, that it has forced that conversation. I believe that that conversation is coming. The if a kid wants to take private piano lessons, they are uh, they're going to pay for it on their own. If a if if that kid is a uh, a kid on free and reduced lunch. Um, then, um, then I believe school districts that that uh, have conversations about how they're going to uh, work to make that happen um, is 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 that part is not formalized yet. So, um, yeah. Okay, so, thank you. thank you. So another question then is that we see a lot of families that are homeschool yep. um, because they want that experiential learning, and you know that's yep. really based on the homeschoolers that we've worked with. They do yep. do a lot of that experiential learning. So do you see a lot more partnerships forming between schools um, because of this competency-based, you know, if a school takes, or actually in New Hampshire, since everyone is co doing competency-based um, or is mandated to, are there more of these partnerships with the homeschool groups? Uh, but I think that, you know, the, the, having served on the state board for a long time, the, the homeschool folks are not, the easiest bunch to work with, and um, they. Uh, my experience is that uh, they have, uh, in large part, uh, not a lot of trust uh, and um, and faith in the um, in the system as it exists. The, the, your, you know, the state board, you know, local districts, etc. Um, what when we talked to them, we told them that. Uh, in many ways, what we are doing is is putting inside the regulations uh, lessons we've learned from them. And um, you know, someone described this to me. Uh, they said that this is homeschooling with professional oversight. And uh, I thought well, it's kind of interesting way to look at it. And um, so, uh, I, you know, I think that more and more uh, homeschool families will look at this and 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 see that they can have the best of both worlds. That uh, that they can have their student participating in the in school stuff as much as they want, and and do the outside of school stuff, um, and still have uh, you know professional uh, you know professionals uh, inside the system uh, overseeing to ensure uh, high standards and quality. So I do think that those conversations are going to uh, you know continue happening and and actually ramping up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? If anyone wants us to unmute them, um, please let us know. It, Lisa, as I look at, I'm going to just step in here for a second, Fred, because we're looking at the control panel. Okay. And it looks like a few people muted themselves rather than us muting them. Is that what you're seeing, Lisa? Yes. Okay. Um, because I, and I don't know how that, that happens because somebody isn't able to unmute themselves. Um, so I'm not sure what we're actually seeing. But my point is if anybody wants, and if we can, if they want to be unmuted, if you could just put that in the chat, um, we can finish out here with um, any kind of conversation back and forth that you might want to have with Fred. I've been kind of, um, you know, revisiting some of the, the things you've been saying. And I, the beginning part, Fred, was great listening to you put your energy into the description of that first part of the book where you talk about the epiphany. It was fun to yes. hear you, you know, with your own energy behind that. I love that. Um, if there are not any more questions, we can begin to kind of wrap things up. Uh, I, I would, uh, I, you know, gladly take any more questions. I would say that I am absolutely convinced that this is the future of public education, that it, it's going to be better, it's going to be more cost effective, um, 
that um, we will have more services for our kids than ever before. Um, we will these 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 seven thousand kids that drop out of school a day that'll go you know that'll largely go away if we do this right it'll largely go away, and um, and kids will love learning because they're going to own it. It's going to be theirs. They're not going to be doing it for the teachers. Uh, they're not going to be doing it for the school. They're going to be doing it for themselves, and um, and um, you know we do that. Uh, we will. Um, we will have. Uh, I think the the service that we do to our country is going to be amazing. I'm I'm hoping that somewhere in this presidential conversation, that uh, the the competency discussion uh, will happen. We'll see. Uh, but you know, I think we're getting there. Fred, I have a question. I think you're... Sure. Go ahead. Um, do schools find that all the rules and regulations that would be getting in their way and moving toward this experiential learning have been removed so that they have really have uh, an open field in which to operate? I would say in large part, yes. Um, but while I say that, um, you know, I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, and and I know that the, the the New Hampshire Department of Ed knows that that you know that I push them that and that I lovingly push them. I appreciate so much uh, that what uh, Commissioner Barry Barry and Deputy Commissioner Leather are doing because they believe in this and but they know that I push um, and um, uh, you know there are still in the regulations some references to a time-based system. They, you know, they say in the regulations, uh, senior year. Uh, well, wait a minute. What's, so what's senior year? Is senior year your fourth year of high school? Or is senior year uh, the last quarter of accumulating your credits needed to graduate? So there are, some, there are some parts of it that are still that I look at and say, that's not clear enough. And um, you know, so uh, I think that those who are open-minded enough to know what the department wants do not feel constrained by the regulations. Those who are uh, reluctant because they were happy with their, you know, how they operated in the, uh, you know, in a time-based system, they will use the. Um, these gray areas uh, to um, to you know justify doing what they've always done. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Mike. Fred, one of the things that um, I notice as I learn more about competency and, and the things you're talking about, and the, and the you know the ownership that a student takes. And part of that's because they they're exploring their passions. You know, I've noticed more and more, um, or I I think I'm taking more notice of young children who are exploring the world. They're so inquisitive. Whether you know, I'm taking a walk on the beach and you can see them building something, or just mm -hmm. kind of looking at the little critters or whatever they're doing. Yep. You know, they're they're just alive with the desire to learn. And, and then I think back to um, when I was in a classroom, I don't remember seeing that quite as much. And I, I don't mean that as a diss to me or anybody else. I don't mean that kind of thing. But, you know, we, we've gotten into this uh, kind of rut <laughs> in a way of, you know, how we have perceived education. I think it's going to be difficult, um, you know, to transition. Um, as you guys have seen, you've been on this journey for a long, long time, but you're continuing to battle away. I admire that. You're really pioneering, um, you know, a lot of what will make our journeys easier. Um, you know, I'm so appreciative of that. And I think in my own head, I, you know, I look at, I would love to, to see kids throughout their education walk through learning with that electricity that a youngster does when they're sitting on the beach exploring, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. Bring that to life again. That is that is coming. Um, it, if if we fully embrace 
this concept that is what's coming no more you know no more you know i want the word boring removed from mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. vernacular um and i want the word dropout to be in you know uh old news uh, that uh, those were the days when that when we forced kids to you know to jump through these school hoops that really uh, that they found were not important to their life and and uh, and didn't want to be there that if we do this right we will uh, we will get every single kid excited about learning uh, I've always believed that all of the answers to getting a, a student excited about learning uh, the answers are in those kids' heads. The answers are available for free for the asking. What we have to do is create a, um, a uh, uh, you know, an, an uh, education uh, workforce that understands how to ask those questions and knows what to do with the answers, and uh, and has limitless possibilities uh, to make those kinds of of connections for kids. And when we do that. Um, we will we will change America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. This has been wonderful. Um, I pleasure. Thank I you, Marcia. Appreciate your time and all of your you know expertise. This has been wonderful, and I hope someday we can meet <laughs> face to face. Absolutely, I'll love look it. Forward to that opportunity. So thanks very much, Lisa. You can stop the recording, and thanks to all of you for joining us either live today or in the recorded version.